Next, we will hear from Dr. Amy Green, Vice President of Research at the Trevor Project. Dr. Green is a licensed clinical psychologist. At Trevor Project, her team supports the organization's life-saving work by using data and research findings to advance its crisis services and peer support programs, as well as advocacy and education initiatives. Under Dr. Green's leadership, the research team produces innovative research that brings new clinical implications to the field of suicidology and LGBTQ mental health. We're so grateful she is with us today to share her team's research. Dr. Green? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, Dr. Kelleher, for such a powerful presentation. I think that we'll see some of the similar themes show up in this work as well. I am Amy Green. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Vice President of Research at the Trevor Project, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about LGBTQ youth suicide risk during COVID-19. Okay, so for anyone who hasn't heard of the Trevor Project before, we are the world's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people. And those who are familiar are probably most aware of our crisis services platforms, and that includes Trevor Lifeline, Trevor Text, and Trevor Chat, which allow youth to reach out to us using 24-7 uh, phone, texting, and web chat. We also have a safe space online social networking platform for LGBTQ. That's called Trevor Space, and it allows LGBTQ around the globe to connect with one another and find support. This type of virtual network becomes even more relevant during times like the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, throughout the pandemic, we at Trevor have used the phrase physical distancing rather than social distancing because we know that our youth have multiple ways in which they form social connections. And Trevor Space provides a way for LGBTQ to maintain support and acceptance even if they're physically isolated from people and places that affirm them and their identity. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little uh, bit right now. So to support our mission of ending LGBTQ youth suicide, we also have an education department that provides education and skills to others to best support LGBTQ youth and prevent suicide. We have an advocacy department that works to support LGBTQ inclusive policies and to stop practices that may harm LGBTQ youth. Uh, and then, of course, we have the research department, which is where I sit. So one of the reasons the Trevor Project exists is because LGBTQ youth are at significantly increased risk for suicide compared to their peers. And in fact, data consistently shows that LGBTQ youth are four times more likely to attempt suicide each year compared to youth who aren't LGBTQ. There's the minority stress model uh, is used as a primary framework to understand how LGBT youth disparities and suicide risk relate to the experiences they're having in the larger world about discrimination, rejection, and victimization, which then result in shame and stigma. And we know that there's nothing about being LGBTQ that places youth at greater risk for mental health challenges or suicide, that it's the way that they are treated and the experiences that they have. And we also know that this minority stress can be most persistent and impactful for those who have multiple marginalized identities. In our research, that's most often LGBTQ youth of color and LGBTQ youth who are transgender or non-binary. And so, Given the increased risk of suicide and mental health challenges that we already know historically have existed among LGBTQ youth, when we started last year hearing about that there may be a longer pandemic, even though the initial data was showing that youth were less likely to be impacted in terms of their physical health from the COVID-19 pandemic, we immediately became concerned for the well-being of LGBTQ youth during the pandemic. And so in March of 2020, just as the pandemic was beginning to really take hold in the US, our research team created a report, this one that you can see here, detailing what we expected based on what we knew so far about LGBTQ youth and about suicide during major disasters and pandemics, what we expected to be the major concerns. And the, the three areas that we really looked at at that time were how physical distancing from others and being isolated in places 
where youth may not have any support for their LGBTQ identity might impact them, ways that the economic strain, poverty, and job loss might disproportionately impact LGBTQ young people who we know are already more likely to experience poverty, underemployment, housing instability, and ways that the existing high levels of anxiety and depression that LGBTQ youth had historically before the pandemic might place them at greater risk for the excessive stressors that were going to happen during this year. And then as far back as February 2020, so if we think back to that time and how much was unknown, the Trevor Project began preparing for ways we might need to shift our service model to meet the needs of LGBT youth during a pandemic. Previous to that, all of our lifeline calls took place in our call centers in New York and Los Angeles. And thanks to our amazing technology team, they worked around the clock to ensure that we could continue to offer services 24-7 to youth while going fully remote for the first time in the organization's over 20 year history. And so because of that effort, so we were able to continue even as there were surges in our volume with youth experiencing changes like they've never before had with the closure of schools and loss of connections, we were able to be there. We also were able to collect a large amount of data from LGBTQ youth over the course of the pandemic. And so each year our research team conducts a large national survey of LGBTQ youth. You can see there that nearly 35,000 LGBT youth from across the US took part in our 2021 survey. And these are youth ages 13 to 24. This year our data collection occurred in October to December 2020, so sort of right in the middle of the, the pandemic, which gives us unique insights into how LGBT youth were actually faring during the pandemic. And our sample this year was incredibly diverse. So we had 45% of our sample identifying as LGBTQ youth of color and more than one in three identifying as transgender and non-binary, which gives us the ability to look at our findings, not just in aggregate, but more intersectionally to understand the experiences of marginalized subgroups within the LGBTQ community. And so next I'm going to review a couple of our main findings. Since we only have a short amount of time, I would encourage anyone interested in learning more about the survey to go to our website, thetrevorproject.org, and there you'll find the, the full report both in PDF and a microsite format to look through. Uh, I also want to say that before I review this data, I always like to give folks a warning that the rates for suicide and mental health concerns among LGBT youth are quite high and can be difficult to hear. And I also want folks to know that this is a general population sample rather than uh, Trevor's crisis service users. Sometimes when I review this data, people think, oh, that must be the rates that they have for youth who are already in crisis who are using Trevor Project services. But in fact, we don't do any recruitment through our own services. So these numbers are actually what's happening in the broader population of LGBTQ youth this year. In terms of the overall sample, so across all youth, 42% of LGBTQ youth reported seriously considering suicide in the past 12 months, with 14% reporting that they attempted suicide in the past year. And consistent with what we already know about suicide risk in general, those who are younger, so those are LGBTQ youth ages 13 to 17, this was school-age youth compared to those who are 18 to 24, had the highest risk of considering and attempting suicide in the past year, as did those who were transgender and non-binary, where you can see over half of trans and non-binary youth seriously considered attempting suicide in the past 12 months. When we look back at our previous survey, so this is our third year conducting this survey, uh, the rates of considering and attempting suicide remain relatively comparable across the years, but I'd like to draw your attention to the right side of the graph where we see significant disparities for LGBTQ youth of color. Now in some of the preliminary national death data that's come out from the CDC released for the year 2020, there was actually a slight decrease in suicide deaths overall compared to previous years. But the data wasn't segmented, so it wasn't examined in terms of gender and race, ethnicity and age. And in fact, in some state level analyses that have occurred They've shown reductions in their state were among white individuals and that they actually had increases in suicide deaths among people of color. And in our data, when we look at LGBTQ youth of color, we appear to see a growing rates of suicide risk compared to LGBTQ youth. So you can see there that 
of white LGBTQ youth reported that they attempted suicide in the past year compared to 21% among black youth, 31% among native indigenous youth, 18% among Latinx youth, 21% among those who had multiple race ethnicities. And so this is a, a very concerning trend that is something that historically hasn't been attended to in much of the, the field of suicide in general. There is now increasing attention, particularly to the rising rates among black youth in terms of suicide risk. But I, I encourage everyone when you hear data and information about mental health and suicide risk over the pandemic, um, when you hear aggregate numbers to think about the ways that that may not represent all individuals the same, similar to some of the data that Dr. Kelleher presented that's come out recently, we've seen increases in uh, just a recent report from the CDC emergency room visits for suicide attempts, but those numbers for girls have been much higher than the numbers for boys. When we look at aggregate, that number looks much smaller than it is actually when you separate it out. And so it really highlights the importance of looking at the impacts of the pandemic among subgroups, looking intersectionally and not just taking a one size fits all approach to what's happened in this country. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about anxiety and depression. So in the past year of our survey, 72% of LGBT youth reported symptoms of anxiety or a generalized anxiety disorder. And that was using a brief standardized anxiety screening tool with 62% reporting symptoms of a depressive disorder using a brief depression screening tool. For comparison, last year, when we asked these same questions and used the same screening tools, 55% of LGBTQ youth reported depression symptoms. So it does say that we've seen that we might be seeing an increase among a population that already has, those are really high rates of reporting anxiety and depression. More likely than not, LGBTQ youth are experiencing anxiety and depression. And that's true last year, and it's more true this year. Uh, and once again, if you look on the right side of the graph where we break out that data in terms of race ethnicity, when we look particularly at depression, we're seeing greater risk and greater rates again among those who are younger, who are transgender, but also LGBTQ youth of color, particularly looking at the differences in black youth in terms of rates of depression, something that hasn't received as much attention in previous years as it needs to now, and thinking about all that 2020 brought for those youth. When we asked youth how often they would describe their mental health as poor, so a frequency question, never, sometimes, 70% said their mental health they would describe as poor most of the time or always during COVID-19. So really showing that mental health is a struggle for these youth. And unfortunately, when we asked about mental health care, nearly half said they wanted it in the past year, but they couldn't get it. If you look at that pie chart there, you can actually see that the, by far the largest portion of the, of the pie, only 16% didn't want it, 36%, so a little more than one in three, wanted it and got it. But nearly half said they were struggling. They wanted mental health care. They couldn't find a way to access it. And we know there's a number of barriers. Um, we had questions asking them about barriers, and they range from things like fears about how to even talk about mental health, how to find a provider, how to talk to their parents and get help. Um, two challenges in finding LGBTQ competent providers where they live, as well as things like costs and concerns about having insurance cover it. And if you look at the full report on our website, you'll see that there's large disparities in who is able to access care. So if we look at that 48% compared to that 36%, overwhelmingly LGBTQ youth of color in, are in that group who wanted mental health care but didn't get it and less likely to have received mental health care, despite the fact that I just showed you those slides showing the elevated rates of suicide risk, anxiety, and depression. Going back to the original report where we talked about the concerns that we had in, starting just in March 2020 about LGBTQ, one of the main things that we've been concerned about is the idea that these youth would be isolated and distancing in places where they didn't have support for their identity. And in fact, nearly half of LGBTQ youth ages 13 to 24, including 60% of those who were transgender or non-binary, said that COVID-19 impacted their ability to express their LGBTQ identity. And while the rates are higher for those who are 13 to 17, so that's the group that we would assume would be most likely to be living with their families. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about the, the rate at which families affirm 
uh, LGBTQ identities, but it's not high. Um, the rate for those 18 to 24 are also high. And one of the things that we've heard repeatedly on our crisis lines is from LGBTQ youth who were in college or out on their own, and they were in a place where they were able to be out, accepted, and express their identity only to have to return home as the pandemic began to families who were unsupportive and resulting in them having to conceal their identity from their family to hide who they are, uh, which I'm sure you can all imagine can be quite challenging and stressful to happen every once in a while. But for someone to have to conceal and hide who they are on a daily basis after being in a place where they were able to express themselves and safely be who they are can be incredibly challenging uh, and obviously relating to some of the concerns that we're seeing for LGBTQ youth across the pandemic. So, and this, this kind of goes with something that Dr. Kelleher was talking about. Going back to fears about how the economic impacts of the pandemic impact youth. Um, so among our LGBTQ youth, we found that 30% said they had trouble affording food in the past month, asking them about food insecurity, whether or not they ever went hungry or their family didn't have money to buy food, 30% of them, including half of those who are native or indigenous. And I think that we've probably seen the videos of earlier in the pandemic, the lines for food banks with cars lined up, but the reality of this and how frequently it was happening for these youth is quite severe. And as you can see on the right-hand side of the slide, there was then a strong relationship, not surprisingly, between experiencing this type of food insecurity and, and concerns about how they were going to eat and suicide risk with 11% attempting suicide in the past year if they were, didn't experience food insecurity. This doesn't necessarily mean that they were, that they were living in abundance, but, but that that wasn't as much of a concern. Those who were experiencing food insecurity, 25% of those reported that they attempted suicide in the past year. And so while we need to invest in mental health and mental health care, like Dr. Kelleher said, we also need to really invest in the impacts of poverty and preventing poverty and helping families and communities to generate wealth so that we don't see these types of impacts on youth for their well-being. So going back to the conversation that we had earlier about minority stress, talking about the impact of discrimination, victimization, and stigma, and how that impacts youth and how it impacts youth who have multiple marginalized identities. So in this first slide, I'm going to show you the, the rates of attempting suicide based on experiencing discrimination. So we asked youth about three aspects of their identity. We asked about their sexual orientation, we asked about their gender identity, and we asked about their race ethnicity. And for each individual experience of discrimination, so in the past year where you discriminated based on your sexual orientation, 9% who said, no, I haven't attempted suicide, 21% who said, yes, I have attempted suicide. And we see similar impacts there based on gender identity and race ethnicity as well, so almost like a doubling effect. But then we also know these identities don't operate in isolation. So if we look at cumulative experience of discrimination, we can see how multiple forms contribute to suicide risk. In this case, 7% of LGBTQs who said they didn't experience discrimination based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, or race ethnicity. So it's youth who did not experience it. 7% of them attempted suicide. If we look at each cumulative impact, so one type 13%, two types of their identity, 24%, all the way up to LGBTQ youth who were discriminated based on their sexual orientation, their gender identity, and their race ethnicity, 36%, more than one in three, reported they attempted suicide in the past year. And unfortunately, even with the progress that's been made for LGBTQ rights, discrimination remains common, with more than half of LGBTQ youth reporting they experienced it in the past year based on their LGBTQ identity. And in 2020, we have even higher rates of discrimination based on race ethnicity for Black and Asian Pacific Islander youth, with 67% of Black LGBTQ youth and 60% of Asian Pacific Islander LGBTQ youth reporting they were discriminated based on their race in the past year. Really showing that, that, again, while we need to attend to mental health, we can't ignore what's happening 
in the broader society and how those experiences are impacting our youth in ways that really contribute to suicide risk. And so now I'm going to turn to a little bit briefly, and I'm happy to talk more about this in the question and answers about what are, what are the ways that we can interrupt this? What are some of the things that we can do to reduce the risk? So fortunately, one of the most consistent findings relates to affirmation and support from others. So in, in the grand scheme of things, it's not that challenging or expensive of an intervention of providing affirmation and support to tell someone that they're accepted for who they are and they're loved for who they are. That's a, a pretty cheap intervention if you can get people to do it. And so we asked youth about places where they felt affirmed in their LGBTQ identity and focused on places in our, our recent survey where LGBT youth were spending most of their time. So that's online, at school, whether that was remote or in person, and at home. And as we suspected based on past data, only about one in three LGBT youth reported that their home was LGBTQ affirming. So most youth were indeed in a place where they weren't affirmed in their LGBTQ identity. But half said their school was. And for most, online was a place where they could find affirmation and support. And each of these places, when they're affirming, is associated with reduced risk for suicide. But school is generally among the strongest. And this is true in our past research as well, that school is is a very strong protective factor when it's affirming for LGBTQ youth. And so it's a place where we need to invest in training and support of all school staff uh, to ensure that more than 50% of youth describe it as affirming. We'd see a large change in the well-being of LGBTQ youth if that number went up to 50, 60, 70% of LGBTQ youth who had an affirming school, you know, ideally with the goal that we would get to a place where every single LGBTQ youth went to a school where they felt they were affirmed and able to be themselves in their identity. And finally, I'm going to leave you on uh, one last slide about the well-being of LGBT youth, and that is that although LGBT youth discussed a number of challenges in their lives and ways they were struggling across the COVID-19 pandemic. They also listed hundreds of, hundreds of ways they find joy and strength. Uh, and that includes things like visibility and connection to the LGBTQ community, having access to supportive and accepting friends and family. Uh, and we know from our research that having at least one accepting adult results in LGBT youth being 40% less likely to attempt suicide. And so that's why we encourage all adults to work towards being an accepting person for LGBTQ youth. Uh, and if you look at this and you look at this list, you can see that, that the ways to improve things and the ways to support LGBT youth are really quite simple. It just takes um, all of us being willing to be that person who accepts, supports, and loves an LGBTQ youth. And so thank you, and I'm looking forward to taking uh, questions and talking more about this during our question and answer section. Thank you so much, Dr. Green, for the Trevor Project's leadership, um, both raising public awareness through your research and providing the crisis intervention services you mentioned to really confront this public health crisis. 